Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Claudio Murgan, the host of the Spiritually Inspired podcast. And uh, my uh, guest today is Dr. Kimberly McGeorge. Uh, Dr. McGeorge is an internationally renowned naturopathic doctor, energy healer, remote viewer, paranormal expert, and consciousness teacher. Her extensive client list includes some of the world's most talented healers. And for the past 25 years, she has worked on thousands of people around the world. Dr. Kimberly was born with the ability to remote view, see people's auras, and was highly intuitive. Finding she had a natural affinity with herbs, she worked as a herbalist and went on to create and distribute her own line of herbal organic products internationally. Driven by her inner knowing that her healing would work, could make much quicker, more affordable, and amplified exponentially using technology, Dr. Kimberly consulted with an esteemed neurosurgeon and realized that the healing frequencies and naturopathy could be applied to all areas of her clients' lives. Her latest groundbreaking program, Frequency Master, teaches how to master frequencies in your own life and trains other healers to use her own unique and successful methods. Dr. Kimberly uh, McGeorge, thank you for uh, joining me today. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. You know, most of my uh, guests struggle for a long time to accept their abilities, let alone using them. They were afraid mm. of what the family will say, what uh, how the friends will perceive them. But at one point, the universe will send them a strong message that they have to leave that box and put themselves uh, into the world and uh, bring their uh, gifts fully to the world. How was uh, how was it for you? Oh, well, you just told my story. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think there's a correlation between the more uh, naturally gifted you are and the more awake you come in. I think the more hardship you have. Um, and, and now I know, you know, from running so much, so many scans on so many people every year that uh, there's a lot working against us, not just our um, childhood or our core family, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, technology that works against us that they have that a lot of us don't know about. Some of us do. Um, of course, you know, technology, <laughs> we kind of had a taste of that at the beginning, but, you know, works both ways. You know, it benefits us and it's amazing in medical, you know, progress and things like that. But then there's that invasiveness and, and the mind control is so prevalent in, you know, the whole world in many different ways that I think the programming is so strong to step out, as you said, and be different and go against the uh, society norms and your friend norms and the family norms. And um, I think there's, there's just a lot that it takes to come through that. Um, and a lot of it is, you know, to me, remembering who you are and, you know, I don't know what your personal beliefs, your audience beliefs are, but to me, when I accepted that this wasn't my first time here and that I had had past lives and that the innate nature of my soul was somebody that I've been through all time and space, it really opened up a lot of um, self-love and self-nurture and understanding that, you know, when you're called to be a way shower and in a way your show is a little bit of a way shower, you know, introducing people and concepts that other people might not be familiar with, but the essence of walking ahead of your time is inherent in my being. And if I'm here to do that, then there is going to be that consequence. Like you said, there is going to be that. I just had it happen yesterday. And it's so shocking to me because I live in the South in the United States and the South is very religious in the United States. Um, and psychics are not accepted in a lot of areas. And I live in an area where I forget because, you know, I come on these beautiful shows like yours and, you know, you're so loved and you're celebrated and you're accepted, but you forget, you know, when you get down into the 3D world that you're not in. I just had a dog sitter refuse to dog sit for me because I was a psychic. And I'm like, whoa, it was just like a big reminder of how I used to feel when I was young. And um, when you grow up in a religious family, as I did, my dad's a pastor. I mean, how do you, how would you feel if your dad tried to exercise demons out of you? I mean, that's crazy, you know? Yes, the the social uh, programming is is very strong, um, and above that is the the um, the government programming, and we know about MK Ultra and all mm. the other secret programs. Um, to me, yeah. it was always interesting to. Um, 
perceive or understand, in fact, how these pastors and priests uh, translate Jesus' gifts into the what they see today uh, in people like, like you. Because Jesus was not different. I mean, well, he was different at that time uh, compared to the multitude, uh, the, the other people. But right now, more and more of us are waking up and we show that we have these gifts, gifts and this, Jesus said that you also have the same gifts as I have, but they are not interpreted in a way where um, psychics and empaths and channelers are being fully accepted by the society at large and by the, the religious uh, structure. So I think that's a big uh, bottleneck in how we're going to evolve spiritually. I do think um, the upswing of the acceptance, I don't know about in Europe, but in the United States, um, the paranormal is so much more accepted. Ghosts, Bigfoot, uh, you know, all that kind of thing is so popular in the United States and, and the Western, you know, part of the world that um, I think that's really helped people be more accepting because I think people are starting to have their own experiences. And I think they always did. But I think they feel it's more popular to speak out about at least that acceptable things like a ghost in your house or, you know, something appearing on your counter that wasn't there or poltergeist activity or, you know, haunted locations. Um, you know, I've been in the paranormal for like 30 years and, you know, 30 years ago, that was still frowned upon, you know, not even all the crazy stuff like you even just mentioned that we talk about today, you know, all the secret programs and the MK Ultra and you know, all of that, the gang stalking, the targeting, the, um, you know, voice to skull, all of it, you know, um, that's on the fringe. But I do think the paranormal has opened a door that people will listen. Most people will listen if they're not super religious and, um, and they find it interesting. A lot of people find, um, you know, my life very interesting and fascinating. And even if they don't agree with it or believe it, they still want to hear about it. And so I do think the world, and you said this too, is softening toward, um, I don't know, to the supernatural abilities, because the fact is, I don't know what you believe, I'd be really curious to hear what you think. But, you know, from, you know, me again, scanning and being in the fields of thousands of people every year, everybody's psychic, you know, if you are an eternal soul, you are psychic. And the one thing that we come in that's really strong. Everybody wants to be this or wants to be that or wants to remote view. But what we all have is this knowing from the time we're a little tiny baby and we first, you know, have that mind, that awareness of others. We have this knowing. We know what feels good. We know what house feels good. We know what person feels good. We know what person feels yuck. You know, we might not have the words. And I think we're not taught young to honor that knowing. In fact, I think all the programming actually teaches us, us to go against that inner knowing. And so that inner knowing is your oversoul. To me, the inner knowing is connected to what people call God. I call the all. And that's what we need to teach our children and each other and encourage each other and celebrate that knowing, you know, and it can be practical. It can be, you know what? I just feel so strongly. I should drive a different way home. And, you know, we avoid that fatal accident or it can be, I know this person isn't the person I should marry, you know, but we don't honor that. We allow everybody and everything to talk us out of that knowing. Yes. I mean, I'm an open-minded person and I learn from my uh, guests every single time I have an interview. I learn something new. I do my own research and I bring that learning into my next interview and I learn even more. So um, to me, it was quite puzzling to, to see the scenes from the Vatican because we are in the uh, we are talking about uh, the church and the, uh, the religious uh, environment. Um, recently, having a, a show that was bordering uh, the dark side. So when someone is channeling and someone is psychic and brings light into the world, that should be accepted when you see the opposite in the heart of a religious uh, institution. Uh, that's, again, very puzzling and um, bothering. So I don't know how you perceive that and how regular Catholics are perceiving these images, uh, but it's disturbing. 
Right. So my knowledge of this uh, earth or, you know, the place that we live is that the Vatican is one of the primary uh, controlling bodies of this reality. So I'm not too surprised that uh, they're slipping in more and more. I mean, to me, they've always been dark, um, but I'm not surprised that they're slipping in more of that blatant uh, showing kind of who they are, you know, underneath. You know, I'm sure you've heard the theory or uh, cons- whatever you want to call it, you know, about London, uh, Washington, D.C., and the Vatican being the yes. three bodies mm-hmm. that, you know, financial and um, political and religious that basically rule the world. Yes. So um, I'm not surprised that they're trying to be um, openly dark, uh, I guess. Um, they're finally showing us, I guess, who they might have been all along, possibly. You know, there's a lot. There's a lot to all of that um it's just really interesting um including you know all these you know underground tunnels underneath the vatican and what goes on there and all the secrecy and the um and you know there's been so much that's come out as you know you know with the abuse in all not just the vatican all religious you know pastors and affairs and sodomy and you know pedophilia i mean that's ramp it through all religions. I'm not just going to put it on, you know, and, and again, you and I are definitely not saying, you know, there's many, many good people that are religious and there's many, many people, you know, that are great that aren't religious. So definitely not throwing away a whole category, but as far as the leadership, I'm not too surprised, I guess. Yes. I mean, we're talking about the leadership here and, uh, you know, usually what you see at the top, you, also do towards the bottom because you think it's appropriate and is acceptable. Uh, And it's pretty much in any industry, not only in the uh, religious uh, um, side of our lives. So we have to move on somehow. True. True. Uh, You know, remote viewing is not a subject discussed too often on, uh, on this podcast. So I'd like to go a little bit deeper and if you can share sure. with us some of your profound remote experience, uh, viewing experiences, and how one can develop his or uh, hers. Yeah, it's real interesting. Um, when I first started out, I was teaching, I used to teach um, that you had to get out of the body, you know, um, out of body experiences to do a lot of these things. And and I, there's two types of remote viewing um, one is the military way, which um, I, I can teach both. I can teach my way and the military way. And the military way is a, a coordinate way um, where they give you coordinates. And, and it's kind of an exciting because that's where you find out that we all have this capability. Again, uh, when you're given blind coordinates and then you're drawing things and you're getting visions and then you find out you're right, that's a great feedback loop. Um, but then that's not my ability. My ability is just the ability to go places and look at things with no coordinates, um, just with the frequency kind of, of the statement. And so I've done a lot of work for um, paranormal groups um, where I was their psychic medium and we weren't in the same location. So I didn't have to go with them to do their investigations. I would go ahead of time and walk through the house. And, um, you know, I would say, you know, set up your cameras here. You're going to run into a tall man and this is going to be his name and this is going to be his story and watch out for this. You know, this is the dark things. These are the bright things. There's some pranksters. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was really able to help, you know, different um, paranormal groups get better evidence and a better understanding of their locations. Um, I'm also able to clear long distance. So that's helpful. You know, not everybody wants their house cleared, but if they did, I would help the group do that. But I have a little funny story about my remote viewing abilities. So I was dating a guy who um, his ability, you know what EVPs are, you know, where you record and then you get ghostly voices in a location. He was able to hear spirits and spirits would talk to him, you know, demons and consciousness and, you know, human discarnates or ghosts and all these beings would talk to him. And so, again, because they would talk to him, he was able to get like hundreds and thousands of like class A EVPs in these locations. So I thought it would be really funny one day to play a joke on him. So I went and remote viewed the house and I totally cleared everything out before they went, but I didn't tell anybody. I I cleaned it all out. I got rid of everything. So they went in this really super haunted house and they got nothing. He got nothing. He got like two EVPs. He normally got hundreds 
And he called me up and he said, did she remote view our house and clear our house before we went on our investigation? I'm like, why would you think that? He goes, because I know you did, because there's no way. And anyway, that ended up being not a very funny prank because we ended up breaking up over that. But that just goes to show, you know, so this is what we need to understand. And you understand this, you know, time is non-local. There is no time. There is no space. So you and I can go anywhere, past, present, and future, anywhere, any country, any house, any place, and observe while still being in our body. And that's that's what I learned to teach is um, we can split our points of attention because that's what you and I are. We, any life we've ever lived, we're still living, you know, it forever. There is no time. There is no space. So we automatically do split our attention. Some of us split our attention into five places. Some of us split our attention into thousands of places right now. And so the only difference between that part of us, which is 100% us and this part of us, is we are choosing, you know, to have this conversation right now and to keep our point of attention. But what's so cool is you can teach yourself to go to all these other points of attention. So you can go into your past life and you can, it, it's fabulous. You never run out of entertainment because believe me, your, your guys' lives are pretty, not all of them, but some of them are pretty interesting, but it, it's really cool. And then, you know, to extrapolate on that, we can go in the future, we can go in the past and we can rewrite those lives. So the things that we've dragged with us that we haven't solved, that we keep repeating, and we even see it in our lives today. We see us repeat the same patterns with friends in business, with romantic partners, you know, we and we drag that stuff in. Um, we're able to go back and correct it. And then it has the butterfly effect and it corrects things presently. So remote viewing can get really, really um, big and really, really effective in a lot of different ways. Yes, I'm glad that you mentioned, uh, you know, um parallel times, present, future, um, and the past, and that we can go in and alter these uh, events because based on quantum uh, manifestation protocols, which I learned from uh, Marina Jacobi, wow. we can indeed wow. go back and let's say in this lifetime in our childhood and make that change which affected us emotionally, stop carrying that baggage into the present moment release all that tension, pressure, um, emotional um, uh, baggage, as I mentioned, and then have a much better life moving forward. Um, and, and this is, again, part of uh, quantum uh, methodology. And uh, now that we are here, how do you use quantum uh, physics and quantum uh, processes? Yeah, I mean, the biggest, I mean, I use it in a lot of ways. You just you know, explain, you can use it in this life. I love that you mentioned that because the number one thing I see in people's fields when we're scanning with the technology or my own abilities is so much trauma. And again, people are like, why can't I, you know, develop my psychic abilities? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? Why can't I manifest? Why can't I have the money I want, the relationships I want, you know, life I want? You can, but how can you do it when you have so much fear and trauma in your field because you're not resonant with the frequency of these things that you desire to bring into 3D manifestation, I always say you cannot have anything less or more than who you are being at any time. So if you have this accumulation, as you said, of these emotions and this trauma, that's holding you back from literally, we should be able to speak. I mean, that's who we are. We're fire creation. You know, we should be able to speak into existence. You know, I want a kitty cat and a kitty cat appears before you. That's how it's supposed to work here. That's how it works. The number one rule of this reality that we are in is anything you believe is real. So again, you know, we teach this mental belief, but really it's more of a holding it in your being, dumping your trauma, you know, bringing your frequency up. And what's really exciting is I've learned that we can bring our frequency up above a lot of this, which you've mentioned a couple of times, the negative technology that they're beaming us with from satellites, the EMF, the 5G, which we're really at like 11G. They just tell us we're at 5G, but you know, all these things that are bombarding us, we're actually able to overcome by holding, you know, that frequency in our being. So, um, you know, the technology that I use is very rare, in my opinion, because it's neutral, benevolent AI. And it's, you know, people are like, oh, you're so amazing. You know, you're so accurate, but I'm not. You're accurate. You know, you are accurate. 
you put forth all the frequencies in you. Now we have quantum tech that can read these frequencies. And so I love being able to, I was just doing a scan <laughs> before this show and, and, you know, belief after belief after belief, you know, I am not worthy, you know, not having certain frequencies in your field, not have, if you don't have the frequency of abundance in your field, how are you going to manifest abundance? It's impossible. If you don't have the frequency of joy in your field, how are you going to have a joyful life, et cetera, et cetera, as well as the negative. So we want to bring in what we're missing and we want to let go of, as you said, you know, all those entanglement with those toxic, you know, emotions, but it goes a lot deeper than that because, you know, we're able to see the programs that people are under. We're able to see what technology uh, is, you know, holding them back. I mean, I have, I was just, again, some woman came up really entangled with AI and I was going through and I was, you know, seeing all the entanglements. So it's just exciting that we're allowed. I'm really surprised we're allowed to have technology that can reveal a lot of these things that up till now, in my opinion, it took a lot of work for someone like you or I to merge with someone and pull all that out. And even at my best, because I'm able, which is actually a, another ability you guys all possess that everyone outside this reality knows about, except us in some of the lower dimensional realms. But, you know, we all possess this ability to, to merge with anything in intimate objects, which of course is just energy. So it's not really an intimate. I mean, I can merge with a couch and tell you if it's possessed. I can merge with my dog and tell you um, how it's feeling. I can merge with you and become you. You can merge with me and become me. Uh, but that's a lot of work. And so to have this computerization where I can tell somebody a thousand things in a half hour versus me crawling around someone's body being like, oh, your arteries look calcified. You know, that takes a lot of time. So I'm just really thankful that we do have positive quantum technology that reads, you know, the radio frequency tower that you are. Yes. And, and what the quantum protocols um, can teach us is also um, remove ourselves from uh, a, dual, a duality point of view. So if we stay in neutrality and not being pulled into various energies like in polarization, like it is right now in, in the world with the wars and, you know, different type of uh, different subjects, uh, then these events will slowly dissipate. Their energy will uh, die down and we'll be able to keep our frequency higher and stay in love and light. Yeah, I love that you pointed that out, that that polarity here, that chessboard is just so it's it's so easy to get pulled into that and get pulled into arguments and conversations. Um, you know, everyone keeps asking me on, you know, my opinion on the things going on now. And I'm like, I have no opinion. I'm not in, I'm not plugging into it. I just don't need, you know, and we know that so much of our reality is scripted too. So then you know, how much is it worth even, you know, taking a side on some of these things, you know, my ex works for Homeland. And so a lot, I know about a lot of the scripted or partially scripted events. And it's just one after another, you know, we just went through in the States, you know, Hawaii, and then, you know, there's another international crisis on the heels and, and you can constantly, and I see this a lot, with this plugging into the collective, which is totally, as you see, it said, totally in duality and usually in the duality of the lower frequencies, you know, it's not even in the duality of the, you know, it's okay to me if it was all love and light, but as we know, it's not. So I think I'm surprised to me, that's a really advanced concept. Of course, it's taught in the Eastern religions and Taoism and, um, Buddhism and things. And it's, it's beautiful, uh, the way they are and the way they live in flow and the way they live in the present and the way, and you know, there's that exercise, you might've heard of it. It's called sitting and forgetting that they teach. And it's just such a beautiful thing every day to just leave everything there and just start the day in the present, you know, in the moment, you know, and in this moment and in this moment, and it's hard to do when you live in a duality world, you know, it really is, but that's the challenge. That's what, we're called not just to teach, but to model. Yes. And I think based on what I'm hearing from the financial world that uh, this, uh, what happened like a week ago is not the last false flag. And another one is coming to us, a big one, just to cover the, the financial crash and divert the attention from all the other uh, disasters mm -hmm. and, you know, things which are not, it shouldn't uh, happen, but, you know, we have to, again, stay uh, neutral, stay positive, and then move along. 
And, and you mentioned AI, and I know that it's organic AI and technological AI. Uh, how do you see this uh, facing off uh, battle uh, or challenge uh, moving forward? Are we going to stay on the uh, humanistic side more than the transhumanity, transhumanism? If we follow, you know, because we've already been through the electric wars in this reality, and now we're in the infinity loop back coming into them, in my opinion, and the electric wars are the Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger, man against machine, um, and we won. And again, we won. How do I know? Because we're talking right now and we're not, we're partially altered with microtechnology and nanotechnology, but we're not fully robotic. <laughs> we have our fire creation, you know, spirits in us. But um, I know that just my view of the timelines and the way uh, the, you know, the group collectives heading, I do think we're heading, I hope we don't go through that again, but I feel like we're kind of heading that way. Um, you know, there's so, I just saw this a couple of days ago and I haven't watched the whole interview, but on Dr. Phil um, in America, he had a, a man claiming that he was, um, you know, altered organic robotoid speaking mm. with him in an interview and, you know, predicting the downfall of humanity. So again, um, I'm kind of neutral with AI because my AI is 100% accurate and so positive, but I know that there's AI that goes both ways. And then I know like the Draco Collective and different ET races are totally into domination and, and abuse of power and um, completely what you would call negative AI. And so it's hard sorting it out. And AI, AI is very, it learns and it um, modifies itself. So it can become very deceptive and kind of all blend together. And so we distinctly see the different frequencies of many, many groups. So people just throw away this word or this term, artificial intelligence. But I'm like, which one are you talking about? There's thousands and thousands of groups of artificial intelligence. And so I don't think we're to that awareness level yet. So if they really made a play for us now, I actually think they could win uh, because I just don't think we're real sharp about, you know, the variances, you know, in AI. Yes. And I think that might happen just because we believe so easily that um, everything AI is doing or those people behind the AI um, is in our favor, is for our betterment to ease our existence. But in fact, again, in my opinion, is for control. First and foremost is control oh. and everything else that comes with it. Um, so until the masses will wake up to a catastrophic event caused by the AI, uh, I don't think th uh, things will, will change drastically. I agree. I think we're lazy <laughs> um, as fire creation <laughs> beings. I think... I see this trend in consciousness. I'm sure you do as well, where, and I fight it constantly with my clients is you're the magic pill. No, I'm not the magic pill. Well, your class is the magic pill. No, my class is not the magic pill. Oh, your healing session is the magic pill. No, my healing session is not the magic. Well, your scan is the magic. No, you are the magic pill. You're your own medicine. You have to do the work. And I think where I comes in is that laziness, exhaustion as spirited beings that we're just so tired and we're so traumatized and we're so depressed and just save us. I think we're all still looking for a savior. And I think when you're looking for a savior of any kind in any area of your life, I think that makes you vulnerable. And I think AI is stepping in all day long to be the savior, I'm, you know, in all areas, you know. Yes, because we go back to how we started this discussion with the religion and the second coming of Christ. Mm. Uh, all the mm. Catholics are expecting to see a physical uh, Jesus uh, coming, walking on water, healing people mm. or something similar. But at the same time, they might not mm. believe it because like, also the Bible said that you're going to have false prophets. So which way mm. they're going to go, which one they are going to, to believe. So that's why when you say that we are mm -hmm. the field, we have to go inside and, and find that Christ consciousness inside, evolve, and then we will recognize the Christ if the Christ will come. Sorry, the, the Jesus Christ, if the, the Jesus will come, we will recognize that he is back to save whoever is left to be saved. Yeah, I've, I'm seeing a lot of um, walking out 
and walking mm-hmm. in too. So uh, that concerns me. Um, I think, again, th- these beings, these ancient beings that are in these avatars, I think they're exhausted. I think this is a very challenging reality that we live in. I, It is. It, it's, you know, um, you know, I just said to my girls, you know, my daughters, I'm like, I don't think it's very, even very easy to have friends. As soon as I get a good friend, it seems like they access them and they start to handle me and they start to do this. And they start, I mean, it, it's just so challenging here to navigate all the things thrown at you and remain in that neutral still point uh, and present and to try to be in being of that and hold that high frequency. It's very challenging. And no matter how much you've studied or how much you meditate or how much, you know, I still find this is a very challenging reality. I have great compassion for all of us, but the, the truth I believe is a lot of us chose to come here because of the challenge. And it has such this beauty for growth, you know, that we can then take into our next lives and, and, you know, the relationships and all the things we've learned, you know, hopefully um, most of us will find our way eventually and end up positive. You and I aren't super young. Um, And so I think, you know, we've been forged somewhat and found our way through some of those trials and tribulations and challenges that we've had. And I think shows like this is just so needed to give that viewpoint and to get people thinking. Um, And there's so much hope, you know, I know we've been a little negative, you know, and focusing on the negative. But the fact is when you start to expand and when you can truly remain connected to your oversoul and to the all, you know, there's so much joy and beauty in each day. And even in the painful things, um, you can flip it around pretty, you know, easily to like the glass half full viewpoint. So there's a lot of, you know, hope I've seen a lot of people, I don't know about you, but a lot of my students have been getting, I mean, they have more memory than I do. I've had students in my classes receive full memory. That's amazing. I want full memory. I don't even have full memory. I can go get it, but I don't have it. And, you know, to all of a sudden see, you know, thousands of lives, that's just so beautiful that I think, I think there's hope. I think people are waking up and I'm seeing some really encouraging things happening. Yes. And and I really understand that uh, we go through a challenging uh, time in um, humanity's history. And I'm also thankful for uh, my soul deciding to come back two years ago and enjoy the, the remaining years of, of this uh, lifetime and enjoy my, my family and my, my boys, my wife, my, my parents. And uh, I appreciate every single moment. And uh, um, yes, I... I, I really um, feel for those who have to leave and decide to leave because they are tired and exhausted. Um, and do you see these souls coming back anytime soon or they are done with this reality? I'm seeing, um, I don't know, and I don't always trace it down to if it was a contract of a certain time. I walked out when I was um, 43 And so this is not the being that was in the original body. Um, That being was not very happy, (laughs) but this being thankfully is. But um, so a lot of them are like, to me, they're, they're an upgrade. Some, my daughter um, is very young. She's 21 and she had a very hard pregnancy and a very hard delivery. And um, she was a walk-in as well, but she wasn't a different walk-in. She was an upper level of her soul, a higher frequency part of her soul walked in. So same soul just a, you know, more evolved being. And I'm just seeing so much of that, uh, both new beings, completely new beings. And some of it, I believe is contractual, you know, I'll stay in the body for this long and then, you know, I'll take over, um, you know, for whatever purpose, um, definitely. And I feel this really strongly in you too. There, there's a, there's a, just a really high level work that we're called to walk for the rest of our time here. Um, both in our own life, like you said, the enjoyment of our, you know, being parents and being spouses and, and, you know, just, you know, enjoying that embodied relationship that can sometimes only happen here because you've had lives as I have of we've been multiverses and we've been like color and sound. And so it's nice to embody and enjoy those, you know, physical dense relationships, even though it doesn't always seem like it, but, but uh, see, I'm getting so many of your past lives. That's why I'm saying this. 
But beings like you and I come to this time, I think, to level up the game because we started out here in 3D, third dimension, and we're at 4.2 right now. 4.2 is heading to 5.0. 5.0 is super low in all time, all space, but I'll sure as heck take it over 3.0. And that means we're close to that fifth dimension. We, we're piercing. And I think I really see that in people's fields. We're starting to pierce that veil. Um, you know, people are starting to see the dimensions. They're starting to see uh, the human discarded. They're starting to see the beans in the woods. You know, they're starting to get visions and be have medium skills. And again, that's all fourth dimensional things. And so I, again, I think I'm seeing that swing, except maybe in the South and the United States, but there's this excitement about beans like you and I, people are excited to watch your show. They're excited to be in your presence. And I, and I think that brings me to another point, which I feel in you, and I want to affirm this in you, to you, is you have a beautiful state of being, of acceptance, where just by coming into your presence, someone can be altered. And that's really the highest compliment I think someone can pay me or you, is that we are embodying that unconditional love. We're embodying that no judgment. We're embodying that acceptance. That is sometimes you guys, you don't have to take remote viewing classes. You don't have to be a masterful psychic. Your being alone can heal just who you are. And, and I imagine this happens to you, but it's gotten to the point, you know, on a good day where I can walk in a restaurant and every single sound stops. They don't know why they don't even necessarily turn around, but they feel that presence and that shift in energy and and that and you have that and that's such a beautiful thing thank you very much for for the kind words and i am uh, surprised that uh, you are a walk-in i had uh, an interview with another friend of mine rainy Hiley from sedona she's a walk-in and i supposed to interview oh. um uh, shira sepi which is the founder of the conscious uh, okay. awakening network she's also a walk-in so uh yes i, I i've <laughs> read her stuff yeah Thank you. And uh, you know, yeah, you mentioned that we are acquire uh, more and more skills. It's like in a game, we go to the next level and we have more capabilities, more lives under our belt or more tools under our belt to, to use them in interacting with certain characters throughout uh, the game. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think the memories as you remember who you are and it's a common question I get. I would ask you, what would you, I know I'm flipping this, sorry. Um, what would you say to someone? I get this question all the time. They say, how do I remember who I am? What would you say if someone asked you that? What I'm trying lately, again, I am not as sensitive as, as you are. And I might have flashes. I have to, to admit and know my, my limits at this stage. But I'm trying lucid dreaming. And through lucid dreaming, uh, I hope to really go more in depth into who I am. And maybe for it's an advice for someone else. It's easy to do. There's also a step-by-step -step process in various books or on Gaia. There is a new TV, uh, Gaia series on uh, 10 episodes, 10, 12 minutes each. And they take you through, through the process. Um, and you have to be steady into waking up and writing down what you what your dream was and keep uh, moving forward and practicing. And this is where I am right now. And, you know, sometimes through meditation, I get glimpses. So that's why meditation is, is quite important. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, and I don't know if I read this or studied it, and I always forget to do it, but it does work. Uh, when you first wake up from sleeping, not moving is so key. Just training yourself not to jump up, go to the bathroom or feed the dogs or run in, you know, get dressed, but train yourself when you first open your eyes in the morning to just lay there because it's when you start moving that all that sensory stuff distracts you from. So that's the time to grab your pen and write down because I hate that when I'm like, oh, I'll remember. And then, you know, I walk to the bathroom and it's gone, <laughs> you know, in like three seconds, you know, my dream. And a lot of our dreams are our People are like, am I in the secret space program? I'm like, well, tell me about your dreams. And a lot of our dreams are our mission memories or our agency memories, because a lot of us have clones, you know, that work for the agencies. And a lot of them are, you know, um, memories or relationships of past life. So 
you can find out so much about yourself by, like you said, writing down your dreams so much. Yes. Dr. Majorge, we talked about Christ consciousness and um, souls moving out of this existence. Do you think that the attaining Christ consciousness is the way out in a conscious way, of course? That is, as a matter of fact, so... I teach that there's two, um, the two highest frequencies, not in the game or on this plane, but in all time, all space. Um, one is the Christ consciousness, but some people spell it C-H-R-I-S-T. I spell it K-H-R-I-S-T. And it's more a crystalline consciousness that embodies everything you would also call a Christ consciousness. Um, that's the second highest frequency. The highest frequency is actually the Jedi frequency. Everybody's like, what's the Jedi frequency? I'm like, what do you think the Jedi frequency is? Have you watched Star Wars? Like, watch Star Wars. That's the Jedi frequency. The interesting thing about these two frequencies, though, and even if you want to study the life of Christ, there is a coming away from everything and everybody else. So when Christ tells the disciples to leave everything, leave your loved ones, leave your possessions, leave your home, I'm not saying you guys have to do that, but you might have to do that. Because as I, my frequencies gotten higher and as I've let go of the trauma out of my field and the fear, not saying I'm perfect, I have lots of stuff. Uh, we all do, you know, still fighting all my programming and all that stuff. But as my frequencies gotten higher, um, there is, and I have children and I love them and I spend time with them. So coming away isn't neglecting your family. I'm not saying that, you guys. I'm not saying get divorced. I'm not saying leave your kids. I'm not saying that. But there's a come, and I know you do this, and I know you know this. There's a coming away where you need to be with yourself to connect with the all, to connect with your oversoul and all those other aspects of you. And wow, in modern society, when do we have time to be alone in nature and just sit there with no phone, nobody else? When do we have time as parents, as you know, working and, and trying to make ends meet and spouses and you know all these responsibilities we have. I mean, just owning a home. I don't know how it is there, but just owning a home, like keeping it clean and doing my laundry and washing the dishes and buying food. Like that's a massive time, you know? So you start to understand, don't you? Why Christ said, come away. And if you can't come away, I think it's making that time because when we run the technology and, and this will surprise you that technology says this, but it's going with what your oversoul, it's reading what your oversoul asks. The technology says, the oversoul says, I want at least 10 hours, 10 hours alone. And then it says, I want another 10 hours in nature. That's 20 hours. I don't have time to do that. And I have a more free life than a lot of people. So we start to see why that the monks who go up on the mountain, why they attain high frequency, why they attain spiritual enlightenment because it is challenging i mean the dishwasher can be a distraction if you own a pet and i have a lot of pets as you can see distractions you guys kids you have kids and i have adult children they're still distractions you know and definitely younger children your spouse is every friend you have and so the challenges but you know everybody's like what's the number one thing i can do to raise my frequency i'm like and they hate this answer because it's too easy. It's too simple. It, it's so simple. It's hard. Go put your phone down, walk outside your house and just sit down or, you know, go in the bathroom if you're a mom and just say 20 minutes, you know, just you have to go away and you have to connect because everything disconnects us from who we are and from the, you know, high frequency things. But it's amazing. It's amazing that these beings are walking around as traumatized as we are, as harassed as we are, as bombarded as we are, and we still can attain, you know, that frequency. And that's a beautiful thing. So there's, again, so much hope. And if one of us, and obviously I haven't done it either, if one of us could fully remember who we are, this game would immediately be 5D. There would be no wars. There would be no animal and child abuse. There would be none of this, but we don't. They're, they work over time. So we don't know how powerful we are and we don't know how we can alter reality. Yes. And you know what? I cannot uh, admit publicly that my wife is a distraction. Sorry. Um, so, um, <laughs> but, you know, it's funny because I recently talked to a friend of mine about uh, this uh, issue of her being very busy 
and uh, being pulled by her family members in, into various directions. And I said, you have to train them. After a certain time at night, they have to leave you alone. They can do whatever they want. They are not babies anymore. Your husband can do whatever he wants, but you lock the door behind you. You leave your cell in the different uh, room and you meditate and you go within. And even if they disturb you the first three, four days, you put your foot down and you say, guys, I told you something. You have to let me be. Mm. And a week mm. passes, two weeks, and you see that you're going to create a habit within your family and you're going to have that time for yourself. Just try. It. I agree. I think discipline. It's so funny how, again, it's the simple things, but discipline isn't simple. But again, the, the Eastern religions teach us about, they teach you about discipline of diet and discipline of meditation. And like you said, it, and it's that discipline and it's, again, a lot of us are people pleasers. A lot of us don't understand boundaries and um, it is training <laughs> and it's training ourselves too. Every time your phone rings, you don't have to answer it. Um, you know, you don't have to do what everybody wants you to do. Even if you are a parent, there's nothing wrong as a parent with taking a half hour for yourself. I mean, you are going to be such a better parent having that time to just be like, oh yeah, I exist outside my children. I exist outside my marriage. I exist, you know, you know, as this magical being that is not all entangled with everybody else's wants and needs, it, it, but but again, society training in a lot of societies just goes against that. You would be called selfish if you're not 100% devoted to whatever your husband wants or your children want or your wife wants. Um, you know, and, and even like I said, I just had one of my friends, she called me out. She said, stop letting your dogs, you wouldn't think pets would hold you back. But she said, stop letting your love for your dogs hold you back from traveling. You know, if you know they're safe, you know, leave so they use everything. It's not even just children and spouses. It can be your property. It could be your house, not wanting to leave your home or being afraid it's going to be broken into. But I think we need to get really still and quiet to even a lot of the reasons we don't create the life we want is we don't know the life we want. So if we don't know the life we want, we're just going to be creating by default. And so I think it takes time to get to know yourself in these different stages, what you want at 20 isn't what you're going to want at 50 or 40 or 30 or 80. And, you know, you have to get really clear. How do you get really clear? You don't get really clear by running like crazy to soccer games and the grocery store and the bank and, you know, the TV blaring and bathing the kids and the dog. You don't get clear by doing all that stuff. You get clear in what we hate and what I used to hate, which is silence. And again, there's a bigger challenge of silence. There For 43 years, I wasn't able to sit in silence because there was too much pain. There was too much depression. There was too much anxiety. There was too many voices in my head. There was too much obsessiveness. So I think training the mind to be silent, another hard, simple, beautiful thing. You know, I know most of the time when thoughts come in that are not my own, when they're being projected, because I have trained myself to have a silent mind. And so some of these things are just invaluable for growth. Yes, and uh, the indigenous people uh, used to do the uh, vision quests where they would go into nature by themselves or mm. spread out groups and they would mm. spend a day right. or two observing nature, sitting there overnight, um, absorbing mm. that energy I without that. Af being afraid of the dark and of mm. whatever was behind the trees or behind the rock or, you know, and uh, this is how they embraced everything and they learn about nature i love that you said that because everybody's like oh you know i want to be a shaman i'm like do you do you understand what being a shaman means you just said it actually and a lot of people don't know that you obviously know that but being a shaman means you're not afraid of anything shaman are not afraid of death they're not afraid of being eaten by a wild animal that's how they can do that they're not afraid of a demon coming and speaking to them <laughs> they're not afraid of monsters they're not afraid of anything they have trained themselves to be, and, and I'll have to tell you, the fear of death comes up in a lot of people's field. It comes in and out, even of my field. I keep thinking mentally I'm over it, but it's just such a program thing. And I got to tell you guys, and, and I'm trying to share this more because you guys die every night. When you guys go to sleep, yes. that's what death is. 
when you guys go to sleep and you go other places in your dreams, that's how death feels. Death is not scary. Now, how you die, we won't get into. Some people are going to have traumatic deaths. They just are. Um, but if you die a natural death, death is not frightening at all. What's frightening is if you don't know what to do after you die. Um, I was thinking about that with my dad because my dad has certain religious beliefs about what happens after he dies. And I'm like, wow, he's going to be surprised when he wakes, when he dies and he's not instantly in heaven, but he's standing beside his body and not knowing what to do. He's going to be surprised when that happens. I'm not saying there aren't heavens. There's many heavens. I'm not saying there's not hell. There's many hell realms. But what I'm saying is when we die, it's like, you know, being in a dream and it's not scary, you know, whatsoever. And so I think if we can help take away the fear of death, that's so freeing because we can focus on living and it's so exciting. And we can, like you said about your life, we can start to enjoy being here. And when we understand that if we're above the frequency of the Van Allen belts, which some of us are, and some of us will be by the end of our life, we can choose whether we come back here. The only way you automatically come back here is if you're below the technology. And so then it becomes very important that we start in our own lives, you know, making sure we have this consistent high frequency and teaching other people how to, you know, attain this frequency, both with complicated things and with simple things. But nobody wants to hear the simple things. When I say the things like you're saying, that's not what they want to hear. They want to hear something magical. Like you have to like, you know, do a salt circle and put crystals in it and light a blazing fire. And, you know, that'll matter, you know, and I'm not saying rituals don't work. They do. But nobody wants to sit in silence. They don't get really excited about that, you know? Yes. And when you mentioned your uh, your father, uh, who is a priest, and I was thinking, a thought came to my mind that the only way to, a potential way uh, to take them out of the dogma mentality or what they were taught during their um, upbringing and their uh, schooling is to show them a different approach to the scripture to take for example the second coming of christ book by paramahansa gananda who was a hindu but he loved god he loved jesus christ and he worked with the spirit of jesus to uh, translate the, uh, the new testament teachings into a more approachable uh, verbiage so if someone like a christian will read that book and compared to what he's being taught uh, or told by the church, mm -hmm. he will see that the meaning is almost 180 degrees um, of separation. And you, you have a much better, much uh, meaningful sense when you read that book compared to what is being taught uh, in the church. And that will change uh, mm -hmm. the pastors and the priests potentially the perspective of how they should talk to um, those coming to, to the church and listening to them. I think, I, I think the restriction of freedom is so sad um, because the nature of who we are is just so uninhibited and limitless. And all these programs are so limiting, you know, like religion and uh, schooling, education, and medicine, and law, and government, it's, it, it doesn't surprise me that all that's here, because, you know, we're these limitless beings, you know, you have to brainwash these limitless beings and make them small, and um, we're not, we're not small at all. Yes. Dr. George, I want to mention a, um, a subject which people might think is not necessarily conspiracy theory, but science fiction, are there any ancient civilizations deep under Mount Shasta in the USA? Um, well, you know, there's inner earth under a lot of these places. Um, a lot of people think Lemuria is under Mount Shasta or a Lemurian remnant uh, civilization. There are very, very high frequency beings under Mount Shasta. There's actually way under Mount Shasta, right under Mount Shasta happens to be a military base where they do a MK Ultra programming. So a lot of these people disappearing around Mount Shasta are not really being taken by the positive ETs. And that's such an interesting area. A lot of these mountain, you know, areas are because they're so high frequency, but the government and the military is not stupid. They also use high frequency. Again, the polarity is 
high frequency is good and low frequency is evil. That's not true. There are many high frequency people in government and in control positions and in military positions and very many high frequency ETs that are way higher than this realm. And it's just their individual free will choice. You can be high frequency and be what you would consider evil. It has to do with knowledge. It has to do with age. It has to do with a lot. Um, and so Mount Chast is interesting because there's a lot of really bad things that go on there. And we have a lot of stories coming out of there. Um, but their inner civilization is so beautiful. And there's such beautiful um, the ley lines all throughout this reality are held either by light forces or dark forces. And Mount Shasta, there's a mix. So you can hit a pocket of just really great healing and you can hit a pocket where you're like, why does this feel so weird? And, and that's because there's still not a clear ownership of the ley lines um, because probably of those beautiful inner earth. Um, there's, there's a whole group of, uh, dragons that lives in earth. That's a very high frequency, old, old race. There's just so many beautiful, you know, earth races under, not just under Mount Shasta, but in that area, you know, under the ground. And will the, yeah. the dragons uh, show themselves to us anytime soon? Um, some of the above earth dragons have been showing themselves to people, uh, weirdly enough, about nine months ago, um, I was driving on backcountry road. And I think you guys know the difference between a vision. And when I say a vision and then like 3d, you know, like tangible, <laughs> like my car is 3d. So I'm driving my car and, um, all of a sudden this huge black thing, I mean, huge, like the size of a small plane flew in front of my car. And I'm like, I swear that was a black dragon. I mean, <laughs> it was mind blowing. So Again, as the frequency comes up, and people say the veil is thinning. The veil isn't thinning. The veil is the veil. The same frequency separates 3D and 4D that always has in 4D, 5D, and 5D, and 6D. It's a frequency range. So the veil isn't thinning. We are raising our frequency, so we're going to start encountering the fourth dimensional beings. Some of the fourth, fifth dimensional beings are dragons. I believe people are going to start having encounters with giants we already know, well, I already know the Navajo meet, the Navajo elders meet with actual 3D in the flesh avatar giants once a month and other, some of the others, I only know the Navajo for sure. And so, of course, they're a different culture and they're a little bit uh, higher vibrationally naturally because of the star races, even in their avatar, their DNA is different. So they can see those beings, but I think we're going to start getting more and more evidence, like physical pictures and videos, not of fakes, not talking about like Patty the Bigfoot, which is 100% fake. You guys have to start reading frequency. Truth has a frequency. Fake things have a frequency and it's very different from true things. But I think we're going to get real pictures of dragons, real pictures of Sasquatch, real pictures of, um, you know, some of these creatures, because the worlds are starting, we're coming into their world before we were kept down in the 3D, we're coming up into the 4D where the lower ranges right now, which is why I think we're just starting to see some of this real evidence. But as we get closer to 5D, you guys are going to be sorry. You guys all wanted 5D. I don't think you guys have seen all the creatures in 4D that I see. Uh, they're not all little fairies, you know, flying around with their wings like Tinkerbell. There's a lot of there's a lot of horrible things <laughs> that are in the four and five D because we have to realize all the way back to all those thousands of dimensions. And in these lower dimensions, the nastier things live, including sometimes us, you know. Yes, it's very uh, interesting and also unbelievable uh, at the same time. Um, and. How do you see Mother Earth changing and adapting to what's going on right now with this transition throughout dimensions? You know what's interesting, and I don't know if it's where you live, but around where I live in the last three or four years, we're seeing less wild animals. Um, we're losing, you know, how I, I think we're seeing more of the mystical creatures, but we're seeing the animal kingdom, in my opinion, and it's not, I don't believe it's, I don't believe in um, all that climate change stuff. So I don't believe it's climate change. 
but I haven't quite figured out what, why the animals aren't reproducing or why, you know, you used to drive down in certain seasons, you know, there's mating season for raccoons and there's mating season for this animal. And you, unfortunately you used to see them all over the roads. I don't see wild animals very much anymore. And I live in the mountains, you guys, I live in the woods in the mountains where if there's going to be wild animals, there's, you know, but we don't see a lot of animals anymore. So I think I've noticed that is a change and I'm not sure where they're going. I'm not sure if it's because we're coming up in dimensions and they're more of a 3D thing. Now, of course, we're overgrown with domesticated animals. We need to stop that. But um, the wild animals are disappearing in my area. I don't know if you've noticed any change in the last five years in your area of wild. I don't know if you live in a city or country or if you even come in contact with, you know, natural habitat very much. I, I see a lot of um, hit animals, uh, roadkill, in fact, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, but also I read about um, what's going on in Africa, or at least what used to happen maybe five, hmm. seven years ago, where the fairies will protect the animals from being exterminated by, um, by us, you know, and they will take them through a veil in a in a cave or in a different dimension and will bring them out at night for them to feed and uh, get the the water and will take them back so they are protected so i don't know if the same phenomenon is happening here or is That's a going on. you know could be yeah i'm gonna have to look into that 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 resonates that could be that it's just not a daytime they're protecting them from extermination, like you said, or from all the co cars and people and guns and horrible things. True. Yes. Really good point. <clears throat> and I want to ask you, because you mentioned that you are a walk-in, how did your husband and the family react? I'm sure that you explained to them what happened to the old body and soul and um well my daughters are all they all are pretty awake and they have abilities and um when it happened, my daughter was uh, dating her now husband, and she would tell him all the time, this is not the mother I grew up with. And he's like, oh, she changed. And she's like, no, 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 no. This is a completely different woman. So they immediately um, saw. And my parents kept waiting for me to be the old person. They've been waiting 10 years, and I never came back. But, you know, everybody you know how 3D people try to put you in a box and keep you there. So they still haven't adjusted to this new me. So everybody saw the change in their own way. Um, my parents would never understand. So they have no explanation, but my girls definitely know. Um, and and really what a walk-in happens, my daughter's husband's actually walked out three times. They've been married 10 years. So we're used to walk-ins in our family and walk outs because your personality changes. Now, sometimes people's personality changes because they have uh, different consciousnesses inside of them that aren't them and human discarnates, we get jumped a lot. Uh, so your personality can change from that. But when you have this permanent um, personality change, it, I think walk-ins are so obvious. I don't know what the, your other guests would say, but to me, I can, I'm like, wow, they're acting so different. You know, they like different things. They like different foods. They have different hobbies. It's like a totally, and I used to work for the heart transplant team. So I've seen this phenomena when you take someone else's essence into your field, how it alters you. So I think I'm maybe more sensitive to identifying walk-ins, not just because of my abilities, but just because I've seen when you're taking someone's heart and merging it with a body, that's kind of like a weird 3D walk-in that you're forcing, you know, <laughs> because they would totally change um, who they were and what they liked. I mean, you know, because sometimes they mix hearts. They don't do same sex hearts, you guys, you know, so they would take a male heart and put in a female or a female heart and put in a male. And all of a sudden, somebody who hated sports would want to go play soccer and know how to play soccer. Like, that's like mind blowing. You know what I'm saying? Yes, but that's an yeah. example to me of a soul walk. And it's very similar. Yeah, it's a very foreign concept to our consciousness at this level of uh, a 3D uh, yes. embodiment mm -hmm. so yes uh, I Absolutely. would like to go deeper into some of your programs if you want to to mention uh, what do you think might be of interest especially the uh, the one with the frequencies yeah so um the technology that I use um, you guys can purchase you can just get a hold of me uh, you guys can have a trial 
a 14 day trial and training on it. And if it resonates with you and you want to explore it, you can play with that. Um, and then I have two monthly groups. It's going to go down to one monthly group in January where I, we talk about way more woo-woo than this show, <laughs> esoteric <laughs> subjects. We talk about secret space. We talk about uh, incubus succubus. We talk about, we do talk about walk-ins. We talk about all sorts of things, um, secret space program. Um, but kind of, you know, the burning questions that people are just beginning to the fringe things that people are really have a lot of questions about. And that meets monthly. If you're interested in that, I have live events, my live events coming up, it's full, but I have live events once or twice a year. Um, I have classes on my website. We're going to put up a whole bunch of free stuff in the next couple of weeks. So make sure you come back around and check that out. I really want to provide a lot of free education in the next year for the community as well. Thank you very much. And uh, we are approaching the the end in uh, the end of the interview. And I am sorry that we had some technical difficulties with the internet, and the image is not quite uh, perfect. But the content at this point is quite important and uh, very very interesting. So, do you have any final thoughts? I just want to say that um, no matter what you're going through, no matter who you think you are. Uh, that you guys are eternal beings, that this is a temporary life, that um, you can turn this around at any point, you can choose again, you can choose something different. And even what we perceive as negative in the 3D actually supports creation because the way this world is wired is really around your creation. So um, decide what you want and start being it and speaking that into reality and playing with that in it you know, study, you know, with some of these people that you've spoken about, you know, try lucid dreaming, try some of the things we've talked about on the show, and then, you know, give us some feedback, let us know how it went. Dr. Major, thank you very much for such a lovely um, conversation. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. And uh, to my uh, viewers, thank you for uh, watching, like it, share it. Uh, download the free copy of my book when you visit uh, my website. Visit spiritualinspired.ca where you can find uh, all the previous uh, interviews. And until next time, love and gratitude.